Coming up, supporting Ukraine as the fighting continues. Kids are making a difference, like these students in California who are raising money for the kids of Ukraine. And I feel really bad for them because they have to go through all of this. Then, germs explain. How do germs grow in genes? We'll break down the different types of germs, from coronavirus to bacteria, and how best to protect yourself. Also ahead, where the buffaloes roam. We'll head to Montana to tell you about efforts underway to save our country's national mammal, plus making history. Jessica Watkins is blazing a trail for future astronauts and sharing her inspiring message for kids. Any kids watching, I would say, find something that you really enjoy, something that you're super passionate about that gets you out of bed in the morning, and just pursue that relentlessly. And the right stuff. These heartfelt letters written by second graders helped find new homes for these four-legged friends. My name is Sunday Special. I would love to be adopted. If you adopt me, I hope I will brighten up your Sunday like the sun. You'll be my Sunday Special, and I hope I'll be yours. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's always one of the highlights of my week to join you guys. As you can see, I'm back out on the West Coast on assignment, coming to you from outside our Los Angeles News Bureau. We've got another super lineup ahead, including an interesting story about the American bison in Montana. Plus, we'll put you to the test with our pop quiz. But first, let's begin with stories making news this week. Unfortunately, the war between Russia and Ukraine is still going on. It's been two months now since Russia invaded Ukraine, and as the fighting continues, people around the world continue to show support for the people of Ukraine, including these students in Ross, California. Last week, they held a fundraiser, the third graders tie-dyed T-shirts, and sold them for a total of $1,600. Their teacher says all the money is going to go directly to a charity that gives Ukrainian children access to online education. It's important for us to help them because it's what's happening there is just so much harder than our lives are here. And they're just, just trying really hard to just be able to live and like go to school and they can't even, some of them, their schools, like they don't have a school anymore and we need to help them so that they can get a better education. And we, we need to help them. Like if they come back to school, maybe when they're, they go, when they're going up in higher um, classes, they're not gonna know what to do and how, and they're gonna be really behind in class. So that's why we need to help them. If we all do our small parts, then we can all come together and help Ukraine and save it. Big kudos to you guys in Ross, California, also for their teacher, Miss Maggie Baker, for telling us about their efforts. Way to go. Well, let's turn now to the pandemic. New cases of coronavirus continue to rise in states across the country. COVID-19 is a virus, and this virus is a type of germ. Germs are everywhere, but have you ever wondered just what are germs? Our pal, Dr. John Torres, explains. Hi, Dr. John. I am Fana, six years old, and I live in Lemon, California. My question is, how do germs grow and change? I love Nightly News Kids Edition. Bye. Great question. Let's start by defining what germs are. They are tiny, tiny living things found almost everywhere, on plants and animals, and in soil and water. Germs are so small, you need a microscope to see them. Now, most germs actually don't hurt you, and your immune system can fight them off easily without you even knowing. But there are some that can sneak into your body and make you sick. There are four main types of germs, protozoa, fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Protozoa, these are one-celled germs. They often spread through contaminated water. Fungi are plant-like organisms that like warm, damp places. Most of them are not dangerous in healthy people, but can cause things like athlete's foot and diaper rashes. Bacteria are germs that can cause infections you're most familiar with and might have even had. Anything from sore throats to ear infections or even cavities in your teeth. 
In your body, bacteria grow by dividing themselves in two, then again, and again, and again. But not all bacteria are bad. Some good bacteria live in your intestines and actually help you digest food. Bacteria are also used to make medicines and vaccines. And the fourth type of germ, viruses. You're quite familiar with these by now. These germs get inside your cells, multiply, and make you sick. COVID-19, the flu, and common colds are all caused by viruses. So how do doctors tell all these apart? First, they need a sample of the germ. They may swab your cheek, throat, or take a blood sample. Then they can run tests or look at it under a microscope to identify what the germ is. Once they know, they can use treatments and medications to help you get better. Viruses and bacteria can spread multiple ways. We know they spread through the air, like the coronavirus. Some also pass through saliva or by touch. To keep yourself as protected as possible, you want to wash your hands often and keep your immune system strong. You can do that by getting vaccines, eating well, and getting exercise and sleep. And to protect others, cover your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze, and don't forget to stay home if you aren't feeling well. And just like they protect against coronavirus, masks can help protect us from a variety of other germs too. Dr. John Torres, thanks as always. Now let's head to Montana for a look at the work some local ranchers are doing to save the American bison. With that, here's our good friend, Kerry Sanders. Lester, we're on horseback for an adventure. Where are we? We're in Bozeman, Montana on Ted Turner's Flying D Ranch. And how many acres here? 113,000. Wow, that's vast, but we're gonna go find some bison. They're majestic, powerful, and unlike a dairy cow, you best keep your distance because these wild animals may charge you the mighty bison. Bison are definitely a more wild animal than cattle. Jeremy Gingrich used to ranch cattle. Now he's all about bison. What's the difference between a bison and a buffalo? Is there a difference? They're really the same thing. They're, they're two words for the same thing. We use them interchangeably. If a kid says buffalo, they're not wrong. No. They're not wrong. Buffalo, buffalo is just fine. <laughs> bison is their official name, but when the French came to America, they saw this animal and they called it boof. Now that was the word they used for buffalo in Africa, in Asia. And boof sounds like buffalo, and the name sticks today. Once upon a time, as many as 60 million buffalo roamed the open range in North America. But in the late 1800s, they were hunted by U.S. soldiers, almost to extinction. Then, there were only about a thousand left alive. It was a mistake that now we understand should not have happened. So there were two things going on. There was this tr tremendous appetite by the East Coast markets for things like tongues and hides. And there was a desire by the federal government to subdue the American Indian. And to do that, you destroy the bison. Sinister. Sinister. It was, it was the worst example we have of gross mismanagement of life. How lucky are we that from a thousand we have what we have today? Well, we're lucky by design. We are lucky. We're lucky that the bison didn't disappear forever. And it would take another heaven and earth and a great deal of luck and a great deal of time for the plains bison to ever rise again. Today, it's estimated there are more than a half million buffalo in North America. Would you say that we have been successful in saving the bison? Bison, I think, is one of those very few successful conservation stories that we have. How did we save the buffalo? This may sound confusing at first. Conservationists decided to save buffalo by raising buffalo to eat. How would ranching buffalo to then harvest them save the buffalo? It's called counterintuitive thinking. It is a little bit counterintuitive that we need to eat bison to save them, but what it, that does is creates a market that incentivizes more ranchers to raise bison, so we have more bison. And if we didn't have that market? If we didn't have that market, you know, bison might be just relegated to being in zoos or national parks. Here, bison are best served up as steaks or burgers. Their meat, low in fat and high in iron. Trying it for the first time? Eight-year-old Jake and Moyer from Alabama. What is a bison? 
It's, it's like, uh, how do I describe it? Yeah, we saw like a million cows. A cow with a fatter head and more pointy horns. I'm just going to put that back down. The taste test from kids who had never had a bison burger. What does it taste like? It tastes like beef. Just like a regular hamburger? Mm -hmm. I joined restaurateur George McCarrow with my first bite ever of bison. That was good. At one of Ted's Montana Grill restaurants in Bozeman, Montana. What we've done now is there's a whole bison ranching industry across North America and Canada and the United States that is thriving as a financial institution and it's bringing this wonderful red meat protein to America's table at the same time it's saving the bison herd. Did you know thousands of years ago, fossils show bison weighed upwards of 4,000 pounds. Today, the really big ones are over 2,000 pounds. But because of climate change, they're shrinking. In the last 50 years, because temperatures have increased 2.7 degrees, biologists say bison are the smallest they've ever been in evolutionary history. Female buffaloes, 11% smaller. Males, 23% smaller. But the good news, thanks to conservationists like Ted Turner, the bison have been saved from near extinction. The restaurants, Ted's, have done a great job mainstreaming bison as a food item uh, that Americans covet. It, it, is a, it is a good food, it's a healthy food. It, in, in, in a scientific sense, is the best red meat to eat. And so we're lucky that they didn't disappear forever. We're lucky by design, and that's the best kind of luck. And it's fortunate that it's happened because once gone, gone forever. Once gone, gone forever, that's correct. The mighty buffalo, our country's national mammal. At home on the range, again. They're majestic, but they're powerful, so you gotta keep a safe distance, preferably in a car. Lester, back to you. All right, Kerry Sanders, thanks so much for that. Time for our pop quiz, where we put you to the test. The question today, true or false? A hippopotamus can run faster than a human. That's a good one. We've got the answer coming up a bit later in the program. All right, let's turn now to space, one of my favorite topics. This week, NASA uh, astronaut Jessica Watkins blasted off for a six-month-long stay on the International Space Station. Watkins becoming the first black woman to have a long-duration stay aboard that orbiting laboratory. I had a chance to speak with Watkins recently about her message for young girls and boys who dream of going to space one day. What sort of things should kids be working on right now that will put them on a track if, if they someday want to become an astronaut? Absolutely. For any, any kids watching, I would say find something that you really enjoy, something that you're super passionate about that gets you out of bed in the morning and just pursue that relentlessly. Um, however, whatever opportunities you can find, after school programs, internships, NASA has a lot of those available. Uh, any way that you can just really dig into that and just put all of your effort towards it, that is the way to get to realize your dreams, um, particularly focusing on the STEM field, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, in order to help with NASA in particular. But whatever it is that you love, just keep doing it. The future astronauts who may be watching this, do you think they can expect to have a chance to go to Mars someday? Absolutely. Mars is particularly close to my heart. Uh, my graduate work was on Mars in particular, and so the idea of getting to uh, send people there and get boots on the ground and actually pick up those rocks um, is super exciting. So um, I really look forward to seeing uh, one of you who's watching today uh, stepping foot on Mars. All right, well, speaking of inspiration in our inspiring kids series this week, second graders in Virginia recently learned about the power of words and persuasive writing when they were asked to write letters to help find new homes for some four-legged friends. Our good friend Kate Snow has details. These second graders in Mrs. Jones's class were given a unique writing assignment. The idea just came to me that wouldn't it be cool if we can write persuasive paragraphs through the eyes of the adoptable dogs? That's right. Imagine you were the animal wanting to get adopted. What would you write? Please be my owner. I need you to do it. Available for adoption. 
before the students started writing letters, a puppy ambassador from Animal Care and Control in Richmond, Virginia, paid a special visit to their school. The students learned about the animals and then got to work writing letters to help the 24 dogs and cats get adopted. We picked the residents that have been there either the longest or seem to have the most trouble being adopted. I like to eat treats. I love to run and I'm very gentle. I want to be adopted. Will you adopt me? Liza Jane Shearer wrote her letter for Cody. If you like big gray dogs that are big and friendly, I'm your dog. Come adopt Cody. And guess what? The assignment worked. Parker Widoff helped get Missy adopted. It's really exciting to actually know that the dogs are actually in forever homes. Because for a second there, when I first figured out what we were doing, I didn't know if it was actually gonna work. Hello, my name is Sunday Special. I would love to be adopted. If you adopt me, I hope I will brighten up your Sundays like the sun. You'll be my Sunday Special and I hope I'll be yours. Aubrey Consalvo says she's happy the whole class could participate together. I just thought that special dogs need special homes and they shouldn't just stay in the same place their whole life, so they should like be in a place where they get more attention and more love. Cody and Marie Lucas adopted their dog, Bonnie, from the shelter after reading this. I like to go outside and play rough. I am cute and short-haired. I can cuddle and bark. Listen, ruff, ruff, ruffity ruff, 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 ruff. Please adopt me. The couple enjoys taking Bonnie on walks. She does get very tired, so we just invested in a really heavy-duty wagon to take with us because sometimes she decides to stop walking in the middle of our walk. Just this sort of newfound joy, this new thing that we have and we get to take care of together. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Mrs. Jones hopes this special assignment will inspire other classes to write letters for animals in their own communities. Team up with your local animal shelter. It's a, an amazing experience for all. The power of persuasion and an experience these students won't soon forget. All right, Kate, thanks so much. What a great, great story. Well, let's get the answer to the pop quiz, shall we? The question, true or false, a hippopotamus can run faster than a human. The answer is true. Hippos are the second largest land mammal. The males can weigh up to 6,000 pounds, but that apparently doesn't slow them down. Hippos can run up to 30 miles per hour. For comparison, the average human male can run eight miles per hour. Do the math. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at NBCUni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember, take care of yourself and each other. So long for now.